Hello and welcome to week one, part six of EGM 703, Applications of Thermal Remote Sensing. In this lesson, we'll look at a few different examples of a, a few different example applications of thermal remote sensing. I mentioned that we're going to look at some of the applications of thermal remote sensing here. Obviously, this is only a small subset of the different applications that we can find, but I've tried to put together what I think is an interesting balance of different disciplines and approaches here. We'll start by looking at a few different examples from volcanology before going into the urban heat islands, global wildfire monitoring, and sea surface temperature. The first volcanology application we'll cover here is hotspot detection. A hotspot is defined as a pixel or group of pixels that are significantly brighter, which is to say hotter, than the surrounding pixels. The example here, taken from a 2004 paper by Pieri and Abrams, illustrates this very nicely. In these thermal band images, we can see clearly that most of the volcano here is dark, which means it's at lower temperatures, except for a few exceptionally bright pixels that we can see here near the summit of the volcano. In nighttime images like these, hotspots hot spots tend to stand out even more because of the diurnal cycles that we covered earlier this week. On volcanoes, hotspots can be indicative of increased activity. For example, we could see active fumaroles or places where hot volcanic gases vent into the atmosphere. They can also indicate crater lakes or active lava flows. The examples shown here are from Chilique's volcano in Chile, which started to show increased thermal activity in 2002, possibly indicative of increased activity before an eruption. As of now, at least, the volcano is still dormant. On the previous slide, I mentioned active lava flows. These are, of course, normally incredibly hot, usually in excess of around 400 Kelvin. At higher temperatures, there is significant emission in the shortwave infrared as well as the thermal infrared. And this is something that can actually help us with atmospheric correction since it gives us an additional window, in quotation marks, to use to estimate the atmospheric components of the radiance measured at the sensor. In the example shown here from a paper by Harris and others, they used repeat Landsat ETM Plus images to help map lava flows at a volcano in Guatemala called Santiaguito. Repeat thermal images can also help to estimate cooling rates, which helps us understand how these flows are changing over time. In addition to lava, volcanoes also emit gases like sulfur dioxide or SO2. We can see two examples from here, two examples here from the Pieri and Abrams paper. The first is a false color thermal infrared composite that shows a sulfur dioxide plume highlighted in purple. The second is an image that shows an estimate of how much sulfur dioxide there actually is present in that plume. For most life forms, sulfur dioxide can be quite hazardous to breathe, and it might also be indicative of increased activity and the potential for eruptions, so it's something that volcanologists often try to monitor how much absorption or emission there is in a, uh, in a plume is heavily tied to the concentration of sulfur dioxide and other gases, which means that with observations from multiple thermal infrared bands, we can actually estimate these concentrations and monitor to them over time, especially using sensors such as MODIS, which acquire images on an almost daily basis. The example shown here on the right from a 2000 paper by Watson and others shows the estimated sulfur dioxide concentration during an eruption of Mount Cleveland, Alaska in 2001. Switching topics slightly, another major application of thermal remote sensing is in studying urban heat islands. Urban or built up areas tend to be hotter than surrounding rural or not built up areas. This is in part because impervious surfaces, such as concrete or asphalt, tend to be much better at absorbing or holding heat. If you've ever walked across a car park in the middle of the afternoon on a hot summer day, you have no doubt noticed this effect. In contrast, natural or vegetated surfaces 
tend to be better at regulating heat and keeping temperatures lower. The figure here comes from a 2021 paper by Benz and Bernie, which looked at the variation in urban heat island effects in the United States. It shows the difference in daytime temperature during extreme heat events for urban census tracts versus rural census tracts in the same region. We can see that, in general, the darkest areas, corresponding to the largest change in temperature, are located in built-up areas. Because urban areas are not all the same, however, there can be significant variation even in the same city. What this paper showed is that in the United States, there was a significant correlation between the most extreme urban heat islands and the race and economic class of the people that live there. In general, the poorest areas, or those areas with the highest number of minority residents, tended to be much hotter than more wealthy areas, or areas with a larger share of white residents. This, of course, has significant consequences for public health, and is something that we will have the opportunity to look at in this week's practical and the subsequent uh, class project. A 2019 review paper on urban heat islands found that since 2005, the number of studies of urban heat islands has positively exploded, especially for cities in Asia, with an increase of only a few papers published between 19, 1972 and 2000 to over 200 published between 2010 and 2018. The majority of these studies use freely available data, including Landsat images from a variety of different sensors, or MODIS images, which partly explains the massive increase. In general, these studies have broadly agreed on what controls the distribution of urban heat islands. As we mentioned on the previous slide, this is broadly related to factors such as impervious surface area, albedo, and vegetation cover, but also landscape cover and climate. Based on this review, the main limitations for studies of urban heat islands are that the measured surface temperature is not directly comparable to the air temperature, which means that direct validation of the measured temperatures can be more difficult. In addition, cloud-free images are often very difficult to find, which can bias results. And we also have issues related to resolution. For example, MODIS images are acquired more frequently than, than Landsat images every one to two days compared to around eight to 16 days, but at a much lower spatial resolution of one kilometer compared to about 100 meters. Another big application of thermal remote sensing is in monitoring and studying wildfires. For an actively burning wildfire, the radiance at approximately 4 micrometers is much higher than the radiance at approximately 11 micrometers. Remember from Wien's displacement law, the wavelength of peak radiance is inversely related to the temperature. For a wildfire burning at several hundred Kelvin, the radiance emitted at 4 micrometers is going to be much brighter than the approximate background temperature of 300 Kelvin, especially because we're often talking about sensors with a resolution of several hundred meters to over a kilometer. As we've mentioned before, MODIS, the Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectrometer, acquires images every one to two days, depending on the location, and it also has multiple bands in both the mid-infrared, around four or five micrometers, as well as in the thermal infrared, around 10 to 11 micrometers. This means that we can use MODIS, as well as the fact that fires have much brighter radiance in the mid-infrared compared to the thermal infrared, to study global wildfire dynamics, as was done in this 2006 study by Giglio et al. By dynamics, I mean factors such as the duration and timing of the wildfire season in a given area, as well as the intensity. With observations that stretch back over two decades at this point, we can also study these factors over longer time periods and see how they are changing in the face of climate change. The final application that we'll cover is sea surface temperature. The first observations of sea surface temperature from space were made in 1967. One thing to keep in mind, however, is that is what exactly we're measuring when we say sea surface temperature. 
What we measure with a satellite is usually the so-called skin temperature, marked by the red star here. Uh, this is the temperature emitted by the surface at a depth of approximately 10 micrometers for the wavelengths that we're typically using in thermal infrared remote sensing. Depending on ocean conditions though, this can vary significantly from the water temperature at even one millimeters depth. So we need to be mindful of this when we're interpreting our satellite, inf our satellite observations. The first global observations of sea surface temperature were made by 1972, but it wasn't until 1979 that we had satellite sensors with channels at different wavelengths that enabled us to use the split window atmospheric correction methods that we discussed in the previous lesson. The main sensors that are used for observations of global sea surface temperature are AVHRR, which has observations available from 1978 to the present, though only from 1979 where we have multiple bands in the thermal infrared. We also have the Advanced Along Track Scanning Radiometer, which provides observations from 1991 to the present. MODIS, which provides observations from 2000 to the present. The Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, which succeeded AVHRR, which is and is available from 2011 to the present. And the most recent addition, the Sea and Land Surface Temperature Radiometer on board the Sentinel-3 series of satellites, which was first launched in 2016. For smaller scale or higher resolution studies, other sensors that we've covered, like ASTER or the various Landsat sensors, are also quite useful. In this lesson, we've looked at a few different applications of thermal remote sensing. As we've seen, there are a number of different applications across a number of different fields. Importantly, thermal remote sensing is not limited to applications that deal directly with land surface temperature. For example, we saw how thermal remote sensing can be used to estimate volcanic plume composition, to help in monitoring volcanoes. Other applications, which we'll look into a bit more next week, include mineral identification. And of course, there are many examples of applications that deal directly with land surface temperature, which we also covered. As always, I've included links to the different articles referenced in this presentation here. They're also available on the slide notes, and you can find PDF versions of the articles on Blackboard or in the Zotero library. I've also added a few additional papers to the Zotero library that weren't covered here, so feel free to browse those as well. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!